I'm honored to welcome UK-based composer Nick Bikach, who has scored over 150 productions for television, film, and the stage. So, Mr. Bikach, would you mind telling us something about yourself and uh, how you began composing for film and television? Yes, I started composing, well, I grew up in a house with um, a piano and my mother was musical. She used to play the piano as well. And for us, more or less, as soon as I could reach it, I started uh, playing around with it, which led to a habit of improvising. And um, all, the, all through my childhood, I was sort of used to making music as my principal interest, really. When I was at school, I was just about to leave school aged 18, and I had the opportunity of um, writing music for a, a play in a very small theatre, which I think it's only seated 150, in a provincial town in right. England. What did you go to school for? What was your major at first? Um, well, I, I, di I did uh, languages and music. I did French and Russian and music. That's awesome. uh, because um, one side of my family came from um, Odessa and mm. uh, Georgia, and the other parts came from France and, and uh, Ireland. So I'm a bit of a mixture of all sorts of things, really. Um, but um, th then I entered Oxford University to do music. But in fact, I had already started when, uh, because I had this opportunity for the, my first job when I was just about to leave school, I knew that I wanted to spend my life in music. Mm. And I, I realised that the core of my music making was inventing, improvising and responding to moods and stories and ideas. Mm. Um, and when I got the opportunity to write in the theatre, I realised that it was a, a wonderful opportunity to be commissioned to do music, uh, even when there was little or no money, to be asked to do music, which you could then realise and then decide whether it was going to work or not, and then see it in action mm. and learn from it. And I learned a lot from that. Um, when I was at Oxford University, I found that was less useful in my kind of music because I wanted to earn my living as a dramatic composer and the course at Oxford was very musicological and we all want uh, to earn money I mean that's how we live obviously yeah exactly so um, I, I, I really flourished once I got out of university and worked some more in the theatre which led mm. over a period of about 11 years to um, television and film and mm. eventually I you know musicals and a bit of ballet one opera and to the core of my earnings, really, through my sort of 30s and 40s age was um, film and television, mostly television. Now, that leads very nicely into the subject at hand, which is the 1984 version of A Christmas Carol, directed by Clive Donner and starring the famously irascible George C. Scott. So what can you tell us about, like, how you got involved? Like, what drew you into this project? It was good fortune, really, because... Um, Clive Donner, the director, normally worked with another composer who was not available and he didn't know where to turn for music. He asked a lady that he knew called Liz Keyes, who handled composers at an agency called London Management. And he said, who should I work with? I don't know anybody that, that I can get on with. And she said, well, there's this young man who comes from the theatre and because he comes from the theatre, you might get on with him. and You might like his yeah. style. So the tape was sent to him and he liked what he heard on the tape. And I don't know what it was, a selection of things. And he asked, he said I should come and meet him. Um, and I went to the set of the film he was making, which was Oliver Twist. Mm. And that again starred George C. Scott. And I had an interview with Clive in his caravan in the pouring rain, which was battering on the caravan. We chatted about music. He asked what kind of film music I liked, and I mentioned a few things, including Corn Gold. Um, okay. and I right, said yeah, Corn Gold, yes. Yeah. My feeling about, about film music, uh, I explained, was very much to do with that style of telling the story oh, of I the see. music, having a horizontal narrative yeah. which weaves it out of the um, drama. After I'd done that film, he asked me to do um, A Christmas Carol. So the 1951 version of A Christmas Carol, scored by Richard Adamsell, sounds rather Russian and uh, 
rhapsodic in 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 style. Um, but yours contains a lot more varied elements. You obviously mentioned corn gold, but what can you tell us about the composer's pieces, etc., that that may have inspired you during this period? Yes, I I wasn't aware of any particular thing inspiring me, but I I found the atmosphere of the story and Dickens' storytelling so evocative and so descriptive that I somehow felt I, I knew what the mood should be all the time and how the style of storytelling should unfold. Mm -hmm. And Clive wanted the, wanted the music to contain elements of Christmas carols and the English folk song flavour and the courtly dances in the ballroom you know, in dance dance scenes and... Sort of like French-ish, right? Or Yeah, some of that. And and uh, the folk tunes in Fezziwig's shop. Right, yes. Um, uh, but in a way, he was very concerned that the music should tell the story of um, Scrooge's life and be for it to be possible for the music to convey a kind of innocence in flashback. Mm. of him as a young man and there should be a steady progression from that to his very enclosed and sort of crabbed old age where he was sort of trapped by his own meanness and those windows into his past I find a very stimulating sort of thing to write for because he could be in a mood which was pertinent to Scrooge in his old age and then open this door into some sort of pastime of innocence and mm. young love now that mood that you're talking about in his, in his old age, that's a very sort of the most atonal moment for sure in your score. Was there anything that may have inspired that, that part? Not in direct musical terms, no. It's just my emotional response to his state of mind. Fair enough, fair enough. And again, it's, it's just the way I've always written. I, I work very much from an emotional base. And as I said earlier on, I'm, I'm very much influenced by that sort of longitudinal storytelling in music. And um, it's, I suppose I have more in common with that than I do with the more modern style of placement and mm -hmm. individual moments linked to styles and self-contained units of music. I'm very much to do with the long narrative. And I love using the, the, the unfolding of the music to flow in and out of the dramatic narrative and sometimes pull against it so that you're hearing something that gives you a memory of something that you've sp felt before rather than tying in vertically to it second by second. Sure, right. Clark was interested in that. He always wanted the music to provide the emotional undertow, the, the underneath story. Lead the listener somewhere, the same place as, as the story was going, perhaps. Yes. And um, very often the audience, well, always in the story, the audience is building up an awareness of the narrative, which they've built up over the whole currency of the film. And the music somehow has to acknowledge that. It has to acknowledge the fact that the audience knows a lot about how right. the story is going. It's not they've just... read it before, we, one would hope. Sorry? Uh, they had read it before, one would hope. But, in this, um... Yeah, in this case, yes. And uh, your brother, Tony Picot, I believe, wrote the lyrics to the title song, God Bless Us, Everyone. That's and right. I assume that probably isn't the first time you'd worked uh, as a team. What can you tell us about this special collaboration between you and your brother? Hmm. Well, we, he, he's four years older than me. And yeah. from when I started uh, playing music, at that time, he played the drums and we used to play jazz and then rock and roll and things like that with friends right. but from the age of about well, I suppose when he got to the age of about 17 18 he started writing more poetry and lyrics and so he turned to me to to work with as a songwriter and from that then on we wrote songs together on and off and we have done all our lives and so when when Clive asked me to to write a carol and I said well what words do we have I, I he said so someone you want to work with? And I said, yes, I'd like to work with my brother, Tony. Okay. So Tony went to meet Clive and uh, Clive explained what he, what he wanted. He wanted this carol at the centre of, of the film and he wanted it to be somehow 
relatable in a secular, non-religious sense, as well as, it obviously has to mention, God bless us everyone, because that's right. the, the title. <laughs> but he wanted it to be moral and secular rather than overtly like a Christian carol. So it had a sort mm -hmm. of... Um, a moral message to people, you know, whatever that works faith. for everyone, basically. And um, yeah, it was fun, fun to write. And what's, what's quite nice is that over the years, more and more choirs have wanted to do it. So um, it's sort of spreading its way around. Yeah, well, the film has acquired a sort of patent, uh, you know, with the years that have gone by. And, and it's definitely one of the, the favorite versions, it sort of ranks in importance with decorating the Christmas tree for many families, including mine. Um, so mm -hmm. finally, if there was one piece of advice you could give to aspiring film composers today, what would it be? Well, my advice would be to understand the story and take it to heart and express it with your honest emotions. Mm. Yeah, that's very important because I think too many composers are, I mean, I'm not to judge since I'm a violinist, but are often caught up with what they're doing and not exactly why they're, why they're doing it. What do you agree yes. with that? Uh, I think I would agree with that. And I think it's difficult for composers now because uh, over the years that I, my experience of it, going back 40 years, I saw a steady progression from what I was describing earlier, the understanding of the composer as part of a creative team who together tell the story with the filmmakers over the whole currency of the production. A steady progression from that to an idea that music has become more of a service, something which is added at the end, very much in, as a, almost as if you could select music for moments rather than ask somebody to tell the story with the other storytellers in the idiom of music. So I think it's difficult for composers because um, people have an expectation of style, often, which is often wrong, you know, and not to the best interest of the film, but Composers are encouraged quite often to conform to a predetermined idea of style. And I think there's a tendency for style to take the place of content. Mm -hmm. So that uh, instead of storytelling, instead of the um, really digging into the character and human personality of the, of the characters in the story, there's a tendency to think of the externals like the way it looks, the period it's set in, mm -hmm. and the mood from moment to moment. So I think that, as I said, if the, the advice to composers would really be to find out what you feel about the story and tell it in music in your most honest way you can. And then the rest is up to negotiation between you and the director and any other interested parties to um, try and discuss what you want, perhaps, right. you know, as passionately as you can, really. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Bicot, thank you so much. It's been, it's been just such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Not at all. Good luck with your endeavours.